any water left there, Mr. Steinfield. <laughs> they apparently drink all the water on this side, Your Honor, and <laughs> not on that side. Who's going first? I am, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Kahn. Good morning, Madam Chief Justice. Uh, justices, may it please the court. The question before the court today is whether to grant a stay of execution of a sentence imposed in the Superior Court. When I was looking at the rule that guides this, I read the inspirational language used by this court in Rule 31 of the Rules of Appellate Procedure. I guess I'm old fashioned and when I read that kind of language, it moves me. It says, when a defendant meets the appropriate requirements, it has been a long-standing tradition to grant a stay in the interest of justice to avoid imprisoning one whose conviction may not survive appellate review. And I'm asking the court to honor that tradition. Now the standard that the court must focus on today is whether the two issues presented in the defendant's brief filed in the appeals court offer a reasonable possibility of a successful decision on appeal. Now as the court knows, this matter has gone before two justices of the appeals court and a single justice of this court. The issue I submit is limited to whether this case presents a meritorious issue, one worthy of presentation to an appellate court and one that holds a reasonable possibility of success on appeal. Although the single justice has made an adverse decision, I submit that in effect, this court engages in de novo review of that identical issue. The question was raised in Allen, the seminal case on stays, about whether this court should use a higher standard than the single justice if the single justice has denied the stay. In Allen, at page 498, the court rejected that view. Quote, there is no reason for special deference to the judgment of the single justice on such a question. And we think the reviewing court may exercise its own judgment applying the same standard as the single justice. Therefore, if this court finds that there is a reasonable possibility of success, then the stay should be granted. Now the case below was a trial of allegations of sexual abuse. The defendant was charged with assaulting two separate victims, the first occurring in 1993, the second occurring no earlier than 2000. So you've got 1993 incident and 2000 incidents. And the question becomes, can those two sets of offenses be joined for a single trial? This court answered that question when it promulgated Rule 9 of the Rules of Criminal Procedure. Rule 9 gives explicit direction to trial court justices on how to handle joinder issues, both the language of the rule as amplified by the reporter's notes. Rule 9A states in its reporter's notes, unrelated offenses cannot be joined for trial. Therefore, the separate sets of offenses must be related as that term is defined in 9A. It's not a colloquial term, it's not its common usage. This court entered a specific definition of what the word related means. It is a term of art. There are two ways that offenses can be related. The first is they arise out of the same episode. A defendant steals a car in order to drive to the bank to rob the bank, drives away at high speed, hits a pedestrian. All of those charges can be tried together because they arise from the same episode. The only other way that offenses can be defined as related is if they arise and are parts of a single scheme and plan. 
That phrase has been amplified in the leading case of Ferraros, cited in my brief. What it means by a single scheme of, or plan is that the manner of committing the crime is so unique and so distinctive, it's such an unbelievably unusual modus operandi that you can identify a perpetrator just by hearing the unique facts of how he or she committed the crime. That's what Rule 9A means, and it's been amplified in decisions. For example, in Ferraro, a perpetrator wearing a hooded sweatshirt and a bandana or mask disguising his face would knock down a young boy. He would ask the boy for money. He then would sexually assault the boy. A year later, on the one-year anniversary of the assault, he would call the boy and say, remember me? This pattern was repeated for seven people, seven victims. The court had no trouble stating that meets the definition of a related crime because it was so unique. Another case, Feiju. The perpetrator was a karate teacher. He told his students that he was a ninja, and in order for them to reach the highest level of karate glory, they had to become his protege and conquer their greatest fear. And he would persuade them that their greatest fear was having gay sex, and in order to handle this fear, they must engage in sex with him. He did this to nine separate boys over a five-year period. There was no trouble saying that the uniqueness of this made it appropriate to join the, the cases. Mr. Carney, may I ask you a question uh, that is a little different from Rule 9, which is a procedural question. Did you um, ask uh, for a review of the decision of the single justice in the appeals court before a full panel? No, I did not. Doesn't that create a little difficulty for you? I don't think so, Your Honor. As I okay. read the Lewin and Allen, or Levin and Allen decisions, um, I have a menu of, of choices seldom. that I can pursue. But well, haven't we, we, changed, not we changed that rule, yes. right? And not, no longer do you have a menu, um, but you used to have a menu. We used to have a menu. And in fact, I respectfully suggest I'm probably the very last case you will ever see of someone who is pursuing the old menu form where you say, well, I can do an appeals court single justice, I can go to a panel, I can go to a SJ single, SJC single justice. Um, I remember Judge Quirico noting in a concurrence that it was really a, sort of a Rube Goldberg type, type construct, but uh, last fall um, that era ended. The reason that I took the option of going to a single justice of this court was just to expedite the process. I knew that in the county court, I would receive a hearing very promptly, and I did receive a prompt hearing. And uh, so that's why I chose to go that route. And as the decisions make clear under the old format, my next step was to come to this court. So I don't think I'm in any way procedurally barred under the old way of doing things. It's probably not the only thing I'll be talking about when I say the old way of doing things in my own practice, but uh, that certainly applies here. I was noting that there are other cases from this court and the appeals court that have reversed joinder of offenses, in particular sex assault cases, because they were not related. This court in Sylvester looked at allegations that the defendant had committed three separate sexual assaults on three separate individuals. They were joined for trial. This court reversed and said they don't meet the strict criteria we have set forth for defining related offenses. In Jacobs, a chiropractor sexually assaulted a patient, allegedly, and three years later, allegedly assaulted another patient. The appeals court reversed and said three years is too long to show a regular pattern. 
In this case, it was from 93 to 2000. So the 10 counts cluster around those two episodes. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. The dates to focus on are 93 and at the earliest 2000. The reason the court doesn't allow joinder of unrelated offenses, it explicitly says because of the prejudice. In federal court, they could be joined. In federal court, there's a third way to join cases if the crimes are similar. But as the reporter's notes indicate, this court explicitly rejected the third way of allowing crimes to be joined because of the prejudice inherent in that joining to the defendant. I don't say this lightly. Um, I think this is an issue that's going to lead to a reversal of these convictions in the appeals court. And I respectfully submit that a stay of execution should be granted because the defendant has met the criteria. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Steinfeld. Good morning. May it please the court, Kenneth Steinfeld for the Commonwealth. I'd like to focus in very narrowly on the point raised by Madam Chief Justice Marshall, and that is the standard of review in this case. Because the defendant failed to appeal the denials by Judges Kantrowitz and Rubin of his motions for stay to a panel of the appeals court under the Christian case decided by this court in 2006 and the Duong case in 2001, uh, this court's review of the single justice's action is extremely limited, and the only question is whether on summary review, which this court has also referred to as preliminary review, so on summary review, whether the single justice committed an error of law when he denied the 211.3 petition. That is the only issue before the court right now. now but but isn't, isn't whether or not that, that was an error of law uh, whether or not, yeah, don't that, doesn't that automatically feed you into Rule 9? Yes, there is an overlap, um, but the, uh, the court must mean something when it says summary review or preliminary review. It clearly does not mean plenary review of the underlying claims because then otherwise you would have basically two sets of appeals. In the Christian case and the Duong case, the final paragraph of each is along the lines of having reviewed the arguments of the parties below, we are satisfied that the single justice did not commit an error of law. And I suggest to you that that is exactly what the defendant is entitled to here, to have the court review the briefs that were filed in the appeals court and then just ask itself, did Justice, Com uh, uh, did Justice Cordy commit an error of law when he denied the petition. Yeah, and I think, just, I think Mr. Carney would agree with you, but then you have to look at. Was it an error of law? Was it an error of law? And the error of law is, you know, should these two offenses, sets, you know, they've got different indictments, have been joined? Certainly. He's entitled to have this court review that question summarily, not, not de novo. Well, but, but how, how do you, how do you uh, review Yes, it is de novo because it's a question of law. Yeah. But but he has no possibility of success on the merits. Um, I'd be happy to discuss but that. I mean, that isn't, clearly, isn't that the question of law? Yes, that is the question of law, whether he has a reasonable possibility of success on that claim on appeal. Yeah. And I argue that he does not. I have attached my brief to the appeals court to my brief here. But the, the, the primary reason that he has no possibility of success uh, putting aside the question whether or not the offenses, the sets of offenses were related, he has not shown the compelling prejudice that is required to uh, gain relief on a claim of misjoinder. He's got to show not only that the offenses were not related under Rule 9, but that he suffered such compelling prejudice that he was unable to obtain a fair trial. Here, as Judge Welch found, both before trial, at trial, and then a third time when he denied the motion for a stay, the evidence of each set of offenses would have been admissible at trial on just the other set of offenses. I think it's very interesting that if you look at the defendant's brief in the appeals court, he does not argue that that was error. He never says that the evidence would not be cross-admissible. 
He merely says, I was prejudiced because having all of these together would have permitted the jury to conclude that my client had a propensity to commit the crime. That's his claim on appeal. And the basis of the admission of the evidence, let's say you've got the 2,000 acts before the jury? Yes. Uh, um, I'm sorry, the 2,000 acts? You can well, t take it either way, the 1993 acts or the 2,000 acts. Right. They each go to explain the disclosures. Uh, the way these disclosures work. The two victims knew each other, their families knew each other, their families worked together, and uh, one girl first came forward to her mother and nothing was done. Two years later she told a therapist and a police became involved and no charges were pursued. Two years later the second victim heard her mother say that the first victim was a liar and then she said, no she's not, I was abused too, so she decided to come forward. When victim one heard that victim two had decided to come forward, victim one came forward. So as Judge Welch found, there would be no way to separate out these two cases, and the Commonwealth has a right to present to the jury as complete a picture um, as possible. And the first complaint jurisprudence of this court, starting with King, uh, shows that the purpose of first complaint evidence and similar types of evidence is to prevent juries from drawing unfair adverse inferences from delays. The Commonwealth has a right to explain why these witnesses came forward when they came forward. So if you take the 1993 incidents, the, the first complaint comes in, she told her mother. What else comes in? Well, uh, the judge has discretion to admit other first complaint evidence, and here nothing is done. What, what do you mean? Ordinarily, the when there's first complaint evidence, that leads to a prosecution. But what discretion does the judge have to admit other first complaint evidence? Well, I believe that under King, there, it, 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 it says that, uh, uh, that in extraordinary circumstances, he does not have to limit it to one. Uh, perhaps I, I'm mistaken about that. But, but the language in that there might certainly... might have been a heavily contested issue at trial. Uh, I mean, you, you're assuming that, that all of the evidence would come in at both sets. And all I'm saying, what's the basis of that assumption? Well, as Judge Welch found, the Commonwealth could not tell its story without it, and the jury has a right to know, and, and the Commonwealth has a right to tell it, why these girls came forward when they did. It would be an incomplete picture. And as I say again, the defendant does not make that claim on appeal in the appeals court. He, he, he never says, he never says, the appeal is actually being heard. Of course, it's a different appeal. When the cases have been joined, and he's attacking the jointer, he's not attacking the, 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 the evidentially rulings were appropriate in a joinder case. Right, but he's got to prove that he has a reasonable possibility of success on the merits of his appeal. And the evidence of trial came in very similar to what was presented to the motion judge before as to when these disclosures were made, to whom they were disclosed, when they were followed up, when they were not followed up. This is a, a fairly tangled web, as I'm sure this court is sure. The facts are quite lengthy, um, and the history of how all of this came out, it would not be possible for the Commonwealth to, to uh, make its case against one without introducing evidence of the other. But and the fact that the Commonwealth can't make its case against one without, without introducing the facts of another doesn't necessarily mean that the Commonwealth gets to introduce all of those facts. Sure, but as Judge Welch held that they would be admissible because of the Commonwealth's right to present a full picture and to preclude the jury from drawing an adverse inference. Doesn't that essentially vitiate the Rule 9? The, the switches on Rule 9 because if there's a ruling that no, you can't join them and then because you can't present the whole picture, you can get all the evidence in that you would have been able to get and if they had been joined. Isn't that a little circular? Well, I, I, I think Judge Welch was correct on, on both issues, that the claims were related, that it was within his, within his discretion to find that the claims were related. The claims are related they, through the victims, not through the defendant, it sounds like. Well, they were related through the conduct of the victim. There's no... No, 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 they were related... Everything that you said is because they all elaborated about how these victims came forward. They, you haven't said one word about what was what was signature like. I mean, we've got a long right. that's, delay. That's, uh, uh, that's true. I was focusing on the prejudice because he's got to show both. Uh, uh, both, and I think that that the Commonwealth is a much, frankly, stronger argument than there was no prejudice than it does that the, these offenses were not related. I still think we have a good argument that they were unrelated because, as Judge Welch found, the modus operandi of the defendant was sufficiently similar what's to the make modus, them... What's the modus operandi? 
Well, uh, that he would take advantage of girls who were friends of the family, very intimate with the family, when there were people in the house. On several occasions, he woke uh, both girls up uh, to, to sexually abuse them. He, 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 uh, and it, he did not perform the same sexual acts with both all the time, but there was a significance, or, or uh, there was a similarity in certain of the acts. But Judge Welch held that because uh, he took advantage of these young girls in very similar circumstances. He admitted that it was a close call. He said on the record, he said, I've got to percolate on this, and he thought about it, and he came back and he said, although it's a close call, I think that they are related, and I think he did not abuse his discretion when he, he found that they were related. Admittedly, there are no cases that say that offense is seven years apart, that, uh, where one begins more than seven years after the last one ends, and he said this is pushing the envelope. Um, that aside, I don't think the defendant has shown that he was prejudiced. I think the ruling that the judge made below and that implicitly the two judges of the appeals court, Judge Rubin and Judge Kantrowitz, we have to assume that they did their job and they looked at it and they determined that uh, this claim had no likelihood of success on appeal. Presumably they agreed with Judge Welch that there was enough cross-admissibility of evidence that the defendant was not prejudiced. Do you agree, Mr. Steinfeld, that, that, that the defendant in this case is not foreclosed from coming to the single justice um, because he did not pursue a, a review by the entire appeals court? He is absolutely not foreclosed. But what he gives up is the standard of review. No, no, I understand. Well, yes. and he's, he's oh, certainly. Under the rule before... Uh, uh, before October 1, 2009. I believe he filed the 211-3 petition September 8, 2009. So he's certainly under Allen and under Rules 31 I, and 6. I have to say, and I'm not asking you to defend our language, but it's a little difficult for me to determine how we review an error of law summarily. Right. Right? I mean, it's, it's a little hard. That's, that's been my struggle, and I, I think that the word must mean something other than getting deep into the merits. If I could just say this case is being heard one week from today by the appeals court where Justices Barry, Vuno, and Hanlon will be wrestling with this very issue. Well, and they, won't be wish they won't be wrestling with the issue of our standard of review. No, but they'll be wrestling with the underlying issues of whether or not this claim should succeed or not. No, so it, for this court to it do is it, helpful it that it's going to be argued, but as we know, sometimes, you know, if he's entitled to, um, you know, to be released on bail, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but... Thank you, Mr. Steinfeld. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Hear ye, hear ye, 